Welcome to the June 2021 episode of the Family Tree Magazine podcast. I'm Lisa Louise Cook. In this episode, Family Tree Magazine new media editor Rachel Fountain will be here to share our readers' thoughts on cemeteries, a place that genealogists certainly know well. And then genealogy author Rick Kroom is going to stop by to share some strategies for overcoming some of the challenges of scanning your family history items. Diane Southerd will be here to talk about an important aspect of DNA testing, your privacy. And author Sonny Morton returns to the show to compare two of the top photo correction tools, Vivid Pix Restore and the collection of tools available over at MyHeritage.com. And finally, digital editor Courtney Henderson is going to be here to talk about a new and convenient resource over at the Family Tree Magazine website. As always, there's a lot to cover, so let's get to it. If you've been doing genealogy research for a while, then you've probably visited your fair share of cemeteries. Well, here to tell us which ones were your favorites is Rachel Fountain. She's the new media editor at Family Tree Magazine. Hi, Rachel. Hi, Lisa. How's it going? It's going great. And I know you've been busy. You're out there talking to folks on all the social media platforms. And I heard that you asked people what their favorite cemeteries were. It sounds like a question only a genealogist would ask. (laughs) What were you finding? What were you hearing from people? Uh, Well, we heard a lot. We asked on Facebook and Twitter, of all the cemeteries you visited, which is your favorite? And on Facebook, we got over 100 responses, and people sounded off with cemeteries both in the U.S. and abroad of all different sizes, you know, big and small, those that are hidden and those that are nationally known. Um, Some of the interesting comments to me were someone mentioned the One commenter mentioned the Rosalind Cemetery, which is in Washington, Washington State, and it is actually made up of 27 separate cemeteries um, that each have their own unique history. So that was an interesting comment. Um, People mentioned the Abraham Lincoln Cemetery in Illinois. One of the cemeteries abroad that people mentioned was the American Cemetery and Memorial in Luxembourg and how they enjoyed being able to pay their respects to you know, service members that are buried abroad and how beautiful that cemetery was. So it was so much fun to scroll through. And um, not surprisingly, most people's favorite cemetery was the one that their ancestors are buried in. (laughs) Right. (laughs) And our follower, uh, Linda Eccles, she said, my favorite is always the last one where I found the graves I was looking for. And I bet that's true for most people. (laughs) Absolutely. So do you have a favorite cemetery? You know, I'd have to say my favorite cemetery is Spring Grove Cemetery. It's a huge cemetery that's here in Cincinnati. And it's a cemetery as well as an arboretum. So it has all these huge, beautiful trees. Um, And it is an absolute joy to walk around. There are um, some Civil War graves here. There are several mausoleums that are many years old and are just fascinating to look at. Specifically, there's this mausoleum that's designed to look like a cathedral. (laughs) Oh, wow. And it's called the Dexter Memorial. And the grounds are just beautiful. And there's so much history there. I will leave a link to it in the show notes. But it's really kind of a local gem. If anyone's ever in the Cincinnati area, and they like cemeteries, I would absolutely recommend checking it out. Oh, yeah. You know, I I agree with the listener who, or the reader who said that uh, it's the one that your ancestors in. I have to say, though, I, mean, I don't know, I guess it's one of my favorites. One of the most unusual that I've ever run into was on Google Earth. There is really? a cemetery, um, and I want to say it's outside of Louisville, Kentucky, but it is uh, right in the middle of a shopping parking lot at a strip mall. (laughs) And it's so funny, because if you were to drive around that parking lot, you would see kind of a a large hedge in the middle. And it's it's a square might be, you know, uh, 
very small, maybe the size of a dozen or two parking spaces. So as people drive around it, they have no idea what's there. But if you go in and look at it over Google Earth and look down on it, you can see it's a family cemetery that never got Interesting. Away. Yeah. <laughs> so I'll, a little hidden I'm, gem. I know. Yeah, I'm local. So I'll have to go and check that out maybe. Absolutely. Yeah, I showed it on my, on my show and it's uh, really kind of interesting how some cemeteries get moved right but some of them mm. they mm -hmm. they fight and they stay put so real yeah. fun to hear what uh, the listeners have been saying and and tell folks where they can find your questions and participate absolutely so you can follow us on facebook and twitter and i will leave links to these specific questions in the show notes if you want to go on and read our followers responses or join the conversation excellent well lisa i would be remiss to not mention that what we are currently recording is our 150th podcast episode. Can oh you believe that? Gosh, I can't <laughs> believe that. 150. 150. Same so yesterday. To celebrate, um, we have put together a little podcast listening guide for anyone who has not listened to all 150. And basically what it is, is just kind of a collection of little playlists of episodes from the archives about certain topics. So if you are new to the podcast and you're interested in immigration or uh, any specific research topic, check it out and you'll have a little playlist of episodes that you can listen through um, for our tips and tricks. But yeah, 150. So Oh, gosh, it, it really does almost seem like yesterday. I remember um, originally uh, talking to you guys about doing the show, I think it was back in 2007 or eight. Uh, <laughs> but we have covered, a, you're right, a lot of topics. And I think that's a terrific idea to compile them up in a playlist. So if you want to learn about German research, or you want to learn about cemetery research or whatever, I know we have tons of content on that. Where can people find this? I will leave a link in the show notes, but they can also go to our website and it will be familytreemagazine.com backslash podcast listening guide. Perfect. All right. Well, sounds great. And uh, I will look forward to talking to you in episode 151. Awesome. Sounds good, Lisa. <laughs> Bye. Though scanning technology has improved, there are still things that you have to consider before you get started in a project. Well, author Rick Crooms' new article called Scan Do Attitude explains how to scan oddball items, things like photo negatives and oversized documents. And he's here to tell us more about it. Hi, Rick. Hi, Lisa. Hey, this is a great article. I get these kind of questions all the time. I know everybody is kind of, you know, challenged to keep up to date on the technology. And we all have, you know, photos and projects and things to work on. You kind of outlined in this article, which is terrific, it, you've got kind of four big challenges that people face quite often. Um, how to scan oversized documents, how to scan slides and negatives, uh, how to, to combine multiple scans. I know I get that question a lot. And how to quickly scan a whole filing cabinet. Now, the last one really intrigues me. So tell us, is it possible to quickly scan an entire cabinet full of stuff? Well, quickly is in the mind of the beholder, I guess. <laughs> but so, since I've been doing it for several years, but you can do it faster than you would one page at a time on a flatbed scanner. You know, you're probably like me, you probably started researching your family history um, long before uh, online databases became available and right. digitized documents became readily available. Um, so I accumulated a lot of paper files during the early years of my research, including correspondence and photocopies and notes, and they take up a huge amount of filing space. And so I really wanted to reduce the, their size into something more manageable. And you can do that reasonably fast with a specialized scanner called a sheet fed scanner. And I bought a Fujitsu scan snap scanner several years ago. And so the way it works is um, you just stack up uh, like about 50 sheets of paper on the scanner, hit a button, 
and the sheets fly through the scanner and it saves them all as a single PDF file. And so it works really slick. Um, instead of, let's say, attaching multiple pages to an event in your genealogy software or an online family tree, you can combine all the related pages into a single PDF file. So it's much easier to work with. Um, so in the article, I give a link to an album that I have on Family Search and Family Search Memories, where I've uploaded a number of family documents and pictures. And for example, one of them is a 35 page Civil War pension file. So I save that whole thing as a single PDF file. So um, somebody can view the whole files, easily scroll through the pages, download and save the file if they want to. Um, I also have several other large PDF files in my family search memories. For example, my grandmother did some artwork, uh, quite a few different pieces. So I scanned those pieces of artwork and combined them into three or four separate PDF files. There's a 15 megabyte a maximum file size for attachments to family search memories and for ancestry member tree attachments. Um, so in some cases, let's say I saved all of those pieces of artwork into a single PDF file, it would be larger than 15 megabytes. So I had to divide it into three or four separate PDF files, each one under 15 megabytes. Other examples that I did were multiple pages in my grandmother's diary, also a few autograph books. So anyway, by combining all of these separate files, separate pages that really belong together into a single PDF file, they're much easier to work with, and you can easily use them with genealogy software or an online family tree. That is a really neat idea. I haven't been doing a lot of that, but I could really, as you're talking about it, I could see the advantages of um, having one big document because I imagine it makes it much more searchable. Right, and that, that's one advantage with the ScanSnap scanner that I got. It came with, OS, with software that makes the text searchable. So if it's typewritten text, you can search it. And in many cases, even if it's handwritten printed text, I can search it. So it must have the optical character recognition, that OCR? That's right. And, oh, and I should uh, and I should mention, um, I've kind of combined two different things here and maybe confuse people a little bit. The ScanSnap scanner is most useful for pages that are not delicate. It's for things like notes and photocopies and not for historical documents. And so it works if I have, let's say, if I'm working with photocopies of old letters or photocopies of old documents, those photocopies don't really matter. But if I'm working with original documents, I wouldn't want to put them through this sca scanner. I'm only working with my own notes or photocopies or, or things like that, not precious original documents. Right. Well, because like you said, I mean, I, I'm like you, I started at a very young age. So there's a lot of that, all those years of work that were done on paper. But think of the cabinet space, we could free up and be able to capture the notes that we've kept and hung on to, but not have to have them filling up an entire drawer. Gosh, you could, you could fill it with more new stuff. <laughs> Right. I still have another four drawer metal filing cabinet left to scan. So I still have a long way to go to reduce my paper files. But uh, one neat thing about this Fujitsu scanner is that it keeps track of how many pages you've scanned so far. Um, so it says that I've scanned 31,735 pages so far. So that's quite a few. Wow. All of, them, all of them weren't genealogy related, but many of them were. Oh, but you know, and hey, that's even a better reason, kind of gives us a little more of an excuse to invest in a machine that's going to do this kind of work, because you could use it in so many other areas of your life and really get a lot more paper free. I love that idea. And I think while you were talking, you kind of alluded to and mentioned that, of course, you're combining things. And that was another one of the big challenges that you addressed in the article, which was combining multiple items. 
in addition to things like just notes, what comes to mind to me are, are like really large newspaper articles or pages that you end up scanning in pieces, but you want them to end up together. Yes. So I mentioned the 35 page Civil War pension file. That was photocopies that I got from the National Archives. So oh, right. I, I, you know, wasn't concerned if one of them got a little bit ruffled or something in the scanner. So I was able to put easily scan them quickly with the Fujitsu scan snap page scanner. But the other one, the one that I mentioned, my grandmother's artwork, those are photocopies too, but still I didn't want to put them through this fast scanner. So I did scan them one page at a time on my flatbed scanner, but then I used Adobe Acrobat's software to combine the related pages into a single PDF file. And, and as I mentioned, when working with an ancestry member tree or family search memories, the largest file size allowed is 15 megabytes. So I had to keep that in mind. If the related files would be too large, for example, when I scanned my grandmother's diary, the pages, if I had them all in a single PDF file, it would be larger than 15 megabytes. So I had to divide it into about three different PDF files. Well, that's a really good tip to make sure you know if you are going to be dealing with file size limitations to keep that in mind as you're putting it together. You mentioned Adobe Acrobat. Um, I finally invested in that a couple of years ago and wow, I love it because not only can you combine and you can search within it, but you can actually rearrange the order of things too, which is really nifty. It is. It's a super program. It happened to come free with that Fujitsu ScanSnap scanner that oh, I got. Nice. So that's that's how I got. Yeah. So even though the scanner was expensive, that program is expensive too. Yeah. So it was a pretty good deal. And I do mention in the article a couple of cheaper alternatives to Adobe Acrobat. But it is really a good program. And as you said, it gives you a lot of flexibility with working with PDF files. So you can combine a lot of different source documents like Word files, TIFF files, JPEG files, other PDF files. Um, you can combine them into PDF files. You can also divide up a PDF file. And it really gives you a lot of flexibility. Yeah, absolutely. Well, you have really packed this article full of so much great DIY type information. But you also mentioned there might be times where using a service is the best way to go. I'd love to get your thoughts on that. Yes, for example, if you're scanning, let's say slides or negatives, I mentioned uh, three different alternatives. One is using a scanning service like Scan Cafe or Scan Digital, and they tend to do a really good job. And they are, of course, very careful with your precious photos that you might have to send through the mail. And the prices tend to be pretty reasonable. And I used a scanning service mainly for scanning old home movies. And I found one nearby where I could deliver the old home movies in person. So I didn't have to send them through the mail. Oh, but, nice. but, I, but I think scanning services are definitely worthwhile to consider. I've used my flatbed scanner for scanning both negatives and slides. And it really has done a surprisingly good job, I think. Though I do also mention in the article dedicated scanners for for negatives and slides, um, transparency scanners. And I haven't used one myself, but judging by the reviews, it sounds like a lot of people get really good results from them. Yeah, absolutely. I, I know some of them come with like special trays and things that you can that accommodate your slides and, and all that kind of thing. Are there any other um, kind of uh, features that you think people should keep an eye out for when they are shopping for a new scanner of one of these types? Sure. If you're looking for a flatbed scanner, most of them come with adapters for common negative sizes and slides. And most flatbed scanners are not very expensive and do a good job. Uh, if you want more flexibility and you might be scanning a variety of negative sizes, you might want to consider a higher end flatbed scanner. The one I mentioned in the article is the 
Epson Perfection V600 scanner, which costs about $300. And it has a built-in transparency unit for scanning slides, negatives, and medium format panoramic film up to six by 22 centimeters. So that's pretty large. So that would really give you a lot of flexibility in scanning old negatives of various sizes. Well, interesting that you should mention that one. I have it. I actually have the version just before it, the 550. Um, But the Epson Perfection has served me well. And you're right, it comes with the trays. And it also, this one's really was able to go quite large. If I really wanted a super high resolution image, uh, perhaps of an old, old photograph or something, I can really make it happen with this. It's it's kind of amazing. I, I ended up, like you said, getting in trouble sometimes where I'm trying to then upload it somewhere else and they have a limit. <laughs> but the Epson didn't have a limit. So that was kind uh-uh. of nice. Yeah, good. So you've been happy with the that Epson Perfection scanner. Yeah, it's, it's really consistent. And I also have just recently actually started using the PDF feature. I didn't really even notice it when I first got it. I was very focused at the time on scanning slides. But um, now I find that sometimes, yeah, it's actually more efficient to go straight to PDF with particular documents. So I like it. Well, you know, folks are going to like your article because it's really chock full of great usable advice. It's called Scan Do Attitude. And it is in the July August 2021 issue of Family Tree Magazine. It's always great to talk to you, Rick. Thank you so much for uh, helping us out with our scanning. Thanks, Lisa. It was fun chatting. Well, it could be fascinating and fun to get your DNA tested and find genetic matches to other people and your ancestors. Many folks have questions about privacy. And in today's DNA Deconstructed segment, Diane Southard is back to help answer those questions. Hi, Diane. Hi, Lisa. Thanks for choosing this topic. It, it's still one I get lots and lots of questions about. Exactly. And I know that we've touched on it uh, in past episodes throughout the years, but you're right. It, it's one that keeps coming up. Um, there's a lot of new people testing, but there's also a lot of changes within the companies and even terms of service. We see that occasionally <laughs> that they change. So it's definitely worth checking back in. What do you tell people who ask you, how can I keep my DNA information private? Right. Well, the simplest and shortest and most unsatisfactory answer is <laughs> don't test. I mean, and that's that's really true about so many areas of our life, right? If you don't want to um, get into a car accident, don't drive your car. You know, you, you don't want to um, have someone steal your login and passwords, then don't be on the internet ever, you know? So it's extreme, but honestly, that's that's really the only way you can be 100% sure that nothing is going to happen. And that's just the reality of the world that we live in today. Uh, but I think that there are some things we can do to be smart and to be more aware of what um, DNA testing companies are and aren't doing, because as you said, they're different. And and I feel like the, the farther we get into this DNA testing world, the more different kinds of companies are popping up. Um, all the time I get people emailing me or reaching out on social media. Hey, have you heard of this company? What's their test like? And I always say, if they're not the big five, and that in DNA testing language, that to me means if they're not Ancestry, 23andMe, my heritage, family tree DNA, or living DNA, they're not what I would consider to be a genetic genealogy company. And therefore, I don't know anything about what their terms and conditions are, and I don't recommend testing with them for family history purposes. And I imagine a lot of um, these new companies pop up, but they couldn't possibly have even the same size uh, database of, of people who have tested. So there again, the size of the pool really matters when you're trying to make matches, right? Absolutely, it does. And even within the big five companies that I trust, as far as providing a a good product for you, there's vast differences in the way that these companies are handling our data. And so it's so important that you actually read and understand their terms and conditions, that you uh, take the time to fill out the consent form and don't just blindly consent to everything. In fact, for each of our companies, there's usually two different parts to the consent. So the first part just says, you can test my DNA, which I mean, that's why you're paying them. So you're going to have to check that box. But the other one, 
usually ask something to the effect of, can we use your information in our research? And that's different for each company. And so understanding what that actually means for each company is going to help you better make that decision. Do you want to let them use your data to pursue whatever research they're, they're wanting to pursue? Then you check yes on the checkbox. If you don't, you check no. And that is going to ultimately pull your data out of any other pool. It's, you're going to go right through the pipeline to just test and release results, and that's it. So that would be the most conservative approach you could take to the DNA testing experience. And there again, that's probably a really good reason just to really take the time and read the terms, because I imagine some of that stuff kind of gets buried um, further down. You've got, And you might have options that you didn't even realize that you had. So that's, that's a great point. I do agree with you about the fact that in some ways it's like... Um, privacy and safety, just like driving a car, you know, it's an inherent risk in, in whatever the activity is that you're doing, but you can be as informed as you can be. What if somebody tested, let's say a year or two ago, and they see that maybe a company has either changed hands, which I've, I'm not mistaken, Family Tree DNA did, um, mm -hmm. or they've decided, oh, we're going to be involved in some other kind of um, project or, or thing that I don't necessarily want my stuff to be involved in. Can you, uh, will you be notified and can you withdraw? And what happens if you do remove your results? Does that really wipe the slate clean? Right. Great questions. So you're right. All of our companies are updating their terms and conditions for lots and lots and lots of reasons. And yes, you will get an email and it'll probably in the subject line say something really boring like, we've updated our terms and conditions and you'll probably want to just delete it. <laughs> but don't, right? Because you need to know what they're doing with your DNA. Um, if you do come across something, a, a practice that your company is now engaging in that you're just like, no, nah, I don't really want to do that. You can absolutely remove your data from the testing company. However, once you remove your data, anybody who's seen your data before that, or if your data has been um, involved in a, in a research project, they won't be pulled from that ongoing project. So if they, for example, um, Ancestry, if you check that box, they're gonna use your sample to help improve their ethnicity results, for example, or those little genetic communities. So perhaps they've pulled your sample into that project to help refine a genetic community. If you pull your results from, from research, which you can absolutely do, you can change your mind at any time. You can go into your privacy and security settings in Ancestry and say, no, thanks. I don't want to be a part of research anymore. And that will pull you from all future projects, but you've already been added to this genetic communities project, and they're not going to pull your data from that project. So if it's already involved in something, it stays involved in something, but it won't be involved in future endeavors. So once you've kind of jumped in the pool, you, you can't put all the water back in, in a way. <laughs> That's I, mean, so I think true. of how we tell, you know, teenagers, they'll say, oh, well, this app only shows what I posted for 24 hours. But in that time, people can snapshot it, people can do other things. And so in a way, you never can totally pull everything back. So all the more reason, I guess, why the decision up front is so important. Right. And I think it's so important that we're not making that decision for our relatives. I mean, so much of it, we administer in genealogy, right? One person usually is taking on everything for the family, which is fine. But in this instance, you really need to make sure you're sitting down with that family member and taking them through, you know, you don't have to read all the terms and conditions out loud to them, but just summarize and let them know, hey, this is what this says. And do you or don't you want to consent? And I would imagine, I've been asked this question as well, people who see these crime shows and they're using uh, genetic genealogy to solve crimes, in a sense, if somebody else in your family tests, in, in a little way, aren't you sort of kind of out there anyway, even though maybe your name's not attached unless they do that genealogy research? Right. And that's a, that's another big whole, whole deal, right? So of our five genetic genealogy companies, Family Tree DNA basically submits your DNA to their law enforcement database automatically. Uh -huh. And so that's a big thing that you need to understand if you're testing with them. You're you, essentially, as soon as you consent to be tested, you're also consenting to be part of that law enforcement database, unless you specifically go into your settings and turn that off. So it's really, really important to understand what all the companies are involved in so that you don't inadvertently get involved in something you hadn't intended to get involved in. But yes, you're right. Just the nature of DNA testing in family history means that if my cousin takes a DNA test, then it's 
part of my DNA has been tested because I do share a lot of DNA with my cousin, even though I personally haven't tested. So it, it is, and that's a big, um, a big point of debate with this whole genetic genealogy community and law enforcement is how to handle all of this. And I think we're still trying to figure that out. Exactly. There's lots of firsts happening. In yeah, the last lots 10 of firsts. Years. It's amazing. And there's going to be more. Absolutely exactly. will be more. Well, I appreciate it. And of course, um, for those of you listening, if you'd like to read it more, and of course, get lots of great answers from Diane Southard about DNA. Uh, this Q&A came from her premium article. It's called DNA Tests and Privacy. And DNA Q&A is one of those fantastic series of articles that you can get when you become a VIP member over at Family Tree Magazine. So we'll have a link to that article for you members in the show notes. Always great to talk to you. Thank you so much for your expertise on DNA. Thanks, Lisa. Talk to you soon. These days, there are tools available to not only enhance and fix old photographs, but they can also turn black and white into color. But how much should we really be altering our family photographs? In the new Family Tree Magazine article, it's called Touching Up Your Roots. Experts share their opinions and they provide a comparison of two of the top photo colorization tools that are going to help you decide. So here to tell us more about their findings in the article is the article's author, Sunny Jane Morton. Welcome back, Sunny. Thank you, Lisa. So, okay, so which, uh, I think I know which ones, but tell the audience, which two colorization tools did you compare in the article? Well, I think many of us are getting familiar with a couple of our top contenders here. And so the ones in the genealogy space that have proven really popular are Restore by Vivid Picks, which isn't a color correction per se, but it is for image correction. And then My Heritage, which has a full suite and growing suite of color and image correction tools. So those were the two products that really we uh, take a deep look at in this article. Exactly. And it's interesting that both of them really, you know, they didn't start that way. I know Vivid Pix was in like underwater photography originally, and then they had a need to correct pictures. And now we're using that as genealogists. My heritage, of course, is primarily a record site, a family tree site, but they're finding these photos wildly popular. I guess that's just because everybody's got photos, right? <laughs> We all love pictures and we all cherish our old pictures and we all mostly wish they were just a little bit better quality. But, you know, it's a little intimidating sometimes to tinker with your old photos. And that's really the big question that we ask in the article is, do you go ahead and touch it up? I use the the analogy of do you embrace the gray when the the photos are getting old or do you want to touch up the color just like you might do with your hair, uh, which I think many of us are familiar with with. So uh, yeah, the big question there. And I think it's really interesting, the various reasons that we have for wanting to enhance our old pictures. Right, because we don't always know exactly what things looked like in the moment the photo was taken. So any kind of alterations we do, we, we worry we're kind of messing with history. Tell us who were some of the experts that you talked to and what some of their opinions were on whether people should be altering photos in any way. Well, of course, the first person I thought of is our friend, the photo detective, Maureen right. Taylor, right? She is certainly our go-to expert here in the Family Tree Magazine world for um, image correction. And she said, it was interesting because her feelings about this topic have changed. And she mm -hmm. talks about that during the article where she says, it used to be, I didn't so much care for image correction of any kind because I wanted the authentic picture to remain the accurate, the authentic historical record. So she loves old pictures, she loves their inherent beauty, and she liked it to stay that way. But as some of our correction tools um, have become so much easier to access and use, and they're, they're so good, and she started using them and showing them to people, she's like, you know, there's a lot of my relatives out there who respond really well when they see a color picture that they wouldn't necessarily feel that emotional connection to a black and white or a faded sepia tone. So it's all about, for many genealogists, they want to use these powerful images we have to help create an emotional connection and making them more vivid and seem more quote and unquote real um, sometimes has a lot of value. 
Oh, absolutely. And it, it just gets us one step closer to kind of bringing in the rest of the family who are not necessarily <laughs> into genealogy, but right. you know, to get them in, interested and in, in seeing the value. And I think about, you know, we would take a census record that we digitized and certainly do what we could to enhance it, clarify it, bring out the contrast so we can get the real data out of it. And I think in some ways, maybe that's kind of what we're doing with photos. So you talked to Maureen, a very logical choice. Uh, Who else did you talk to and what were some of their thoughts? I also connected with a genealogist I know down in, down your way, down in Dallas, Texas, Christopher Bryant. So, um, and he was interesting. His take was more about Maureen's, more similar to Maureen's original, original. His take was really similar to Maureen's original feeling, which is that he loves the historical, like the look of an old photo. To him, that's what draws the eye. So he sees a lot of integrity in keeping the old picture the way it was, the old coloring, the old sepia, even damage. He feels like that oldness is part of the story for him. So there are exceptions. He said, it, um, if there's a house, a landscape, something like that, that helps you see, you know, a scene, the contrast of the colors of nature, things like that, get a, a sense of the setting. He said that, you know, he's, he feels okay about that and he's willing to try some things, but he really loves that, uh, the original coloring. So of course, I also talked to um, Rick Voigt, uh, the CEO of Restore, uh, the software, and he had lots to say, of course, to explain to us um, what Restore can and can't do, what you use it for. So these were some of the expert voices that really weighed in a lot on this article. It was fun. So give us a a quick sense between the two, VividPix Restore and the MyHeritage. They have enhancement. They also have the colorization. Um, Are they doing very similar things or does anything stand out that's different between the two? So really for me, the difference is I'm going to, I sort of look at Restore as the thing I'm going to go to for like a first round color, contrast, light, sharpness, things like that. Um, And then if there are color shifts, then they try to correct some of those exposure problems, try to correct some of those, but it's all about the correction of the image. Um, And that's, so that's one tool and they do work a little bit differently. Uh, So it was interesting to compare them. So I started, I did this with a lot of pictures, Lisa. It was super (laughs) fun where I'm like, okay, well, I've got this old picture. What happens when I run restore on it? Now what happens when I run any of the my heritage tools. So my heritage has different tools that you can apply one by one or in combination. And it doesn't matter what order you use them. So you can do a colorization tool, which is in color to actually add color that was never there to old black and white images. You can do a color restoration to bring back the original hues that have faded from color pictures. And we've all got those, those red tints or those blue tints from like the 1960s, 1970s, even the 1980s from old slide and print film. And they, they try to color correct that. And then they have their deep nostalgia, which animates and gives several different facial expressions. Um, And then they've also introduced a brand new repair tool to allow you to fix some of the damage spots on your pictures. So they've got this suite of tools and I use them separately and I use them together. And this was Maureen's advice and I followed Maureen's advice because she's the photo detective. And I loved the option of using them together because it gave me, sometimes I found that when I ran the uh, Restore by Vivid Picks first and then ran it through everything at my heritage, sometimes I really liked that result better. Hmm. So it's a question of not which one, but use them all because everything, each one is a little different. They approach the photos differently. And so the correction that they apply is a little bit different. And does Vivid Pix Restore, does that add color the way the colorization does at MyHeritage? Or is that, I think of that as more of a strictly enhancing and correcting the color that's already there. Good clarification, Lisa. That's exactly what it does. So they do analyze the image for color as one of the elements, color, contrast, lightness, and then sharpness. And then they try to to correct anything that has, has gone awry over time, but they are not trying to introduce color 
or work too much with the color itself. Although there are instances where you're going to see some color uh, correction happening. For example, if you mentioned using old documents, color correcting old documents, if you have a yellowed piece of newspaper, then you can yeah. run that through restore and you can take out the yellowed part of it to take it back to its old original black and white. Or you could decide you want to keep a little bit of that yellow to show its age. Right. So again, the age, sometimes that patina of yes. oldness is attractive. So that's that that is something you can do with restore. Right. And I think it's pretty exciting that uh, my heritage is coming out now with the the fixing tool. I don't know exactly what they call it, but you know, where they're repairing that repair tool, because that's another piece. I think of all the photos with the little dots all over them or the tears. And, and many people used to think, oh, why the speckles? Well, sometimes that's just mold. I mean, it could be things happening to that photo years later that really were not part of the original. So I have, I don't feel too bad about, you know, fixing some of that and, and repairing it, repairing tears. It's exciting to see what the technology can do. Um, I'm interested to know, though, did any of your folks say, I really see a downside? Did anybody have any cautions for users? You know, I think that the larger community has expressed some of those where they're just like, well, I, you know, I, once I colorize it, then, I, you know, I, I'm going to think of that as a blue dress, but it maybe wasn't a blue dress. And, the, you know, so it's the, it's important to remember the limits of the technology and some of the creative license we might be introducing when we colorize something. So that that is a concern that a lot of people have. For that reason, both of these technology tools will mark your photos that have been corrected or help you save extra copies of them. So you're not saving over your original. That's always really important. If you want to work with your old photos, it's great. We have a lot of tools to do that. Just never save over your originals. If the scans, especially if you don't have the original to take Take another one. So that's a super important part of it and a part that gets people concerned. And then there are people who just either don't really care for, say, animating it or don't really want to fix out and kind of uh, blur out some of the imperfections in a photo. They worry that when somebody's features, facial features might get corrected or fixed by an automated mechanism that they might not be quite true, quite accurate. Mm -hmm. So those are the things that we want to keep in mind when we start applying some of these technologies. We'll want to look closely and see if, does it, did this really come out in a meaningfully accurate way? Exactly. And and you're right. They both put that little mark. I know on the MyHeritage, it looks like a little painter's palette. And it, it's nice because it gives anybody instantly uh, information that says, hey, this is not the original. This is an enhancement. And um, I love the fact that I know when I used MyHeritage, I could revert back to the original photo. Now, with Vivid Pix Restore, I'm thinking that you're, you're saving the output to your computer. So as you cons- warned everybody, just don't save over what your original was. And then you too can have both the original and the revised. That's absolutely true. So both of them are going to save separately for you. And yeah, you can, that, so you always, you can either revert or you've got your original file. So that is, that's a really plus of working with these. And I did want to mention that, so if you start looking through the article and you're like, well, where's the part about my heritage repair? It's not in there yet because it hadn't come out yet when the <laughs> article was, had gone to press. This is brand new. So that's a fun part of the podcast, I think, is that we can, keep you up to the minute for some of the newer tools and things that come out just in the short bit of time it takes to send a magazine to press. Well, and it seems like there's something new every day and I'm all for it. I I think it's exciting to see uh, these new tools come out, all of them helping us tell a richer story. And and like you said, kind of really reignite some interest in our, from our family members in these old photos as well. Uh, The article is great. It's called Touching Up Your Roots. It's in Family Tree Magazine, the newest edition. We will have uh, a link to the issue in the show notes. And as Sunny said, it's got all the newest and latest, greatest stuff that's going on in the world of photos. Always good to talk to you. Thank you so much, Sunny. Thanks, Lisa, for having me. Well, as you know, every episode, we talk about best websites for genealogy. Um, But here at the editor's desk segment, I want to kind of connect you up with an amazing resource over at the website, which really gets you to all the different 
best websites list that Family Tree Magazine puts out. And here to tell us more about it is Courtney Henderson, who is the digital editor at Family Tree Magazine. Hey, Courtney. Hey, Lisa. So this is a really neat resource. I don't think we've ever really talked about it here on the show. And I know you've done some updates to it. So tell us about the best websites landing page over at FamilyTreeMagazine.com. Sure. So every year, as our loyal readers know, we do put out a 101 best websites list. So last year was the first year that I actually took that list and created landing pages for all of the categories that David Frexell, he writes it every year that he covers. So it's all in one location. It used to be kind of spread out throughout the website in the past. It's all in one location now for easy access. To find it, you can go to the main menu. If you hover on websites, a menu will pop up and the very first one is 101 best websites. If you hover on that, that'll take you to a bunch of sub landing pages for each category. But if you just click on the 101 best websites, that will take you to the main landing page where you can see the list all at once. Great, okay, so after we've uh, clicked on 101 best genealogy websites, we see them all listed here on the landing page. Now, this is really nice. You've got just the names of all the websites listed for us at a quick glance, but they can learn more about these and actually get clickable links, right? That's right. So if you click on learn more underneath each category, it'll take you to a separate landing page just for that category. So for example, if you click on best big genealogy websites, that'll take you to all of the summaries that David has written for each website and why he thinks they're one of the best genealogy websites. And then from there, you can click right to that site. So you can kind of go back and forth between our page and the website that we've honored and just kind of decide which one best works for your genealogy needs. Yeah, and I like his little summaries because he kind of highlights what he thinks is really noteworthy and and why he sees it as a standout for genealogy research. So she kind of gives you a clue what to look for. Right. And I think he also does a good job of pointing out how much it costs. So it's right there for you. And in all the summaries, you can kind of contrast compare if it is a premium site. I do like when we're looking on the desktop computer, um, that little sub menu, because you can kind of read through it there. I see things like genealogy tech tools, best websites, best cemetery websites, best African American genealogy websites. So there's just a wide array of wonderful collections here. Yes. And the categories, a lot of them say the same, but some of them change from year to year. And I know when I was Updating the site, I noticed a lot of visitors were still trying to click on the records. So that we got rid of that category for this year. And those repeats under that category went to either U.S. genealogy websites or cemetery websites. And another change that was made that visitors might notice is we got rid of the state websites category because we do that separately during our 75 best state websites. So if you're looking at the U.S. genealogy websites, those are for all of the U.S. versus doing the 75 best state websites, which is more specific to the state you're looking at. Um, And then another thing I wanted to point out to visitors is using Dave's article, I notated if they were pay and or if they were new to the list for this year. And for 2021, we have 21 new websites that everyone can check out. Oh, great. So some of these might be premium access websites. Is that right? Right. Great. So all of these lists that you guys have compiled are free, but you've gone through and um, indicated for us which of the websites that you're recommending in the list might require a subscription or payment. Is that right? Right. And that'll be notated with a dollar sign. And any one that's new this year will be notated with an asterisk. Is that right? Excellent. Okay, great. So that makes it really easy to um, spot some of the new ones maybe we haven't visited before. And um, so you mentioned that the state's websites list is not in the sub list. Are those folded into others? Or where, where can we find that kind of? That's a separate landing page. And I linked to it from this main 101 best websites page. So it says for the best genealogy websites by state, check out our annual list of 75 best state websites. You can also go to explore by place and click on United States and that's an interactive map and you can click on the state you're interested in and that'll take you to some articles and resources for that particular state, including some websites. Yes, that page is really cool. I encourage everybody listening to uh, do as 
Courtney mentions, click on Explore by Topic and just use the interactive map and you're going to find a ton of great resources. All right, well, so all of this is over at FamilyTreeMagazine.com. So get over there today, check that out. And Courtney, thank you so much for uh, stopping by and telling us all about it. Thanks so much, Lisa. I'm so glad that you joined me for this June 2021 episode of the Family Tree Magazine podcast. As always, I'll have links on the show notes webpage for this podcast episode for everything that we talked about today. You can find the show notes at familytreemagazine.com slash podcast. And be sure to sign up for our free email newsletter, which is packed with genealogy goodies. You can sign up by clicking the newsletter link in the footer of any page over at Family Tree Magazine or go to familytreemagazine.com slash newsletters. Thanks again for joining me today. I'm Lisa Louise Cook, and you can visit me over at my website, genealogygems.com, where you'll find the Genealogy Gems podcast and also my weekly YouTube live show, Elevenses with Lisa. Until next time, have fun climbing your family tree. <laughs>